case of the People versus Ray Creamer. The record should reflect that Ms. Creamer is here, uh, pro se, having been previously uh, qualified as such. Um, Assistant District Attorney McRoberts is here representing the people of the state of New York. Uh, Ms. Creamer, any legal reason why sentence cannot be imposed at this time? No, sir. Um, anything you'd like to say? Yes, please. I live in a, in a very nice neighborhood in Syracuse. Uh, and about two minutes from my house by car is a pretty not nice neighborhood. And very often in the summer, there are many helicopters circling around quite late at night. And it had become my practice to call the police on a regular basis and ask what was happening with the helicopters. And, the kind of answer that I got was, um, well, we had them up there just in case, and they used for surveillance, and they used to trap people, etc. I mention this because the noise of the helicopters is really quite enormous, and it's clear that people would not be able to sleep, that it would be a cause for anxiety, if not fear. And I believe this is a tiny little example of the huge distance there is between the people in this country who for the most part live lives of relative safety, maybe considerable privilege, and have no idea what it's like to, to have to put up with that. I believe that before 9 11 we in this country had no comprehension whatsoever about what it means to be attacked. And that explains in part, I believe, a relatively cavalier willingness to cause the kind of, at least, noise of a helicopter if not the death and destruction of the drones. We have no, we have insufficient experience to empathize. Our experience in World War One of rationing and saving tank and money down into the subway is a poor, poor substitute for the kind of thing that Ed was talking about. Uh, I believe if we lived in that kind of fear, many more of us would stand up and say, wait a minute, this has to change. I also wanted to thank you for your patience and your good spirits and the respect that you showed us. Um, I am a personal acquaintance of Judge Jogo and had said on many occasions since the early time here, thank goodness it was you and not him. <laughs> uh, I don't think he was willing to open his mind to the possibility of learning about a whole bunch of things that he had been unexposed to, and I think that you clearly showed us that you were willing to do that. As the, as the trial was approaching and it was concurrent to an election, and a number of us commented that we saw your name on the election signs, and, uh, and the kind of chit chat that we had about it, well, he's running, so maybe he's kind of going to be nervous about public opinion. But he's running on a post, so he really doesn't care. But how old is he? Is this going to be his last term? And maybe this is the chance for him to show some heroic courage in, in fighting a good fight with us, all on the level of chit chat. But I mention this because it is clear that you have a life beyond the courtroom. And perhaps we need to wait until you retire. But you are certainly indicated as a person, as a man, as a human being, that you have been affected by what you heard. And I would like to think that, that however that jounces is around inside you, that at some point you will have the freedom to act in your ways, if, if that's what your heart tells you. Um, I, at least five or six times over the Thanksgiving holiday, and I went downstate to be with family, described the dialogue you had with Francie Clark. 
And I think that I was pretty good with the words in evoking the feeling of 20 to 30 minutes of silence in this room as you explored with him some of the questions with the capital letters, life and morality and right and how you choose and how you know. And I think it was, a, in a sense, a private moment that we were given to, to watch your experience. It was quite provocative to, to see you reaching out to him man to man to have this conversation. I think the facts of what happened in April had been well presented. To move from facts to maybe talking about truth is perhaps not so straightforward. And it often seems to me that truth is in the eye of the beholder. And since these eyes are part of human beings, there's an awful lot of frailty in, in what we see and what we understand. I'd like to offer some observations that are true for me. There is an awful lot of suffering and heartache in the world. Poverty, disease, homelessness, children living in fear, much of that is caused by things we can't control. Tsunamis and hurricanes and earthquakes, things like that. But it seems to me that given those things that we can't control, it behooves us to do what we can to not cause suffering on us. And in fact, when we see it, it behooves us to try to do something about it. I think what we did was appropriate and merited support and hopefully will be adopted by others as well. The second observation I want to make, uh, and it relates very much to this poster, this is something I've been boringly saying to my friends for many, many years. Um, Without going into the biography, being a mom is really important to me. And I'm the one who's always connecting to the little guys wherever we are. Every single child, every single one that becomes orphaned or wounded or killed has a name and is cherished by somebody. No less than we cherish our own children here. Our government uses euphemism to talk about taking out the enemy. It's disgusting. We are killing. Let's call it what it is. Let's not make any pretense about it. And what happens is we use our intelligence in quotes, to identify the bad guy, to take him out. And if by accident we happen to kill another 30 people, including some of these cherished children, and then the Pentagon or the CIA apologizes, I believe their apologies were sincere the first time. But 10 days later, it happens again. And two weeks after that, it happens again. And I, and I recall conversations with my own children when they did something wrong and they apologized, and then they did it again. And after time three and four, I say, stop the whatever. Fill in the full every word of your choice. You don't mean it. If you're doing it again, then the apology is meaningless. That's who we are. We are acting as if our hearts hurt, our government and the Pentagon and the CIA act as if we are sorry with our words. But if we were truly sorry, we would stop doing it. So when someone has decided that the misery and the suffering we cause to these cherished children is another disgusting term, collateral damage. Let's call it what it is. We are making orphans and cripples out of people who happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time for purposes that are damn hard to understand. How do we change policy? This is a question that you've asked. You're talking about the International Tribunal. And, and I guess like Ed, I'm having a logical, I 
Again, I follow you at a certain point and then I stop. If you allow us to offer the necessity defense and the international law defense, meaning you consider them legitimate explanations, it sounded to me, and perhaps didn't understand, that following your own logic would stop you at the end with procedural issues, not substantive issues. If what we did was in accord with international law, which is the United States Supreme Court of Supreme Law of the Land, doesn't seem unlawful to me. And if what we did was to cause a harm, to break the law, to prevent a greater harm, and if it's clear that our intent was to do that, even though we clearly failed, you know, we didn't stop any drones from taking off, but if that was the intent, I'm not getting the final logic that says, well, that was understandable and justifiable. I sometimes get quite frustrated when well-meaning people like yourself encourage us to write to our legislators, to write letters, to pick it, to vote, to do everything within the permitted time. It feels to me a little skitzy because it's as if we forget that every minute the death continues. It's not a game, it's not an academic exercise, it's not I'm going to be citizen of the world and follow all the civics lessons. People are dying every day, every week. It seems to me that that need, the need to respond to that reality, takes it beyond the letters to the editor. Congress has not declared war in Afghanistan. Congress in our name has not declared war in Afghanistan. And part of me feels again, when the skitzy comes to mind, what right in the world do we have to bomb another country that we want to declare war against? I try to imagine in our, and I'm, I'm going to be strong about this one in a sarcastic way, in our self-righteous, the U.S. is exceptional way, what if someone did it to us? So what if someone decided that, you know, we're the border with Canada, there's all kinds of illegal stuff going on and they don't like it, so they're going to send the drone over. I mean, can you imagine? I mean, it's inconceivable with the reaction of this country. And if we continue to do this otherwise, then somehow we are shocked when the world kind of doesn't like it. I sometimes wonder why the leaders of our country have not been charged with war crimes. I am so proud to be part of this group of people who are obviously caring and obviously passionate and clearly intelligent and clearly serious. And look at Pete Bianco, who was, who was a star in, in his commitment to be responsible about this and serious about it. Um, and I wanted to say to my fellow I don't know how to describe us. Um, determined people. Do not be deterred by this conditional discharge. I expect us to be out there way before a year goes by. <laughs> and the lieutenant said to me as he left, so long, honey, see you in April. <laughs> and my answer to him was a little different. Um, we haven't yet seen policy change as a result of our actions. Nevertheless, I think it behooves us to continue, at the very least to bear witness, and not to become daunted, not to become discouraged, and not to fold in the face of the conditional discharge. Um, I also want to express my gratitude to the Syracuse Peace Council, which has been a rock of support in enabling people across upstate to create the sense of community uh, and to encourage everyone to come this weekend to my new high school to celebrate the Peace Council. Thank you.
I hope you do not become discouraged because and I understand what you're doing and hopefully change will come out of it. I also want to thank you for recognizing sometimes judges um, under the ethics codes that uh, judicial ethics codes are sort of second-class citizens in some respects. I can recall the day where my son in elementary school had they had a family uh, fun night at the elementary school, and they asked me to call the bingo numbers, or what, and I said, no, I can't do that. <laughs> can you sell the bingo cards? No, I can't do that under the ethics code. So what was left was I was janitorial staff. <laughs> so there, there are prescribed limits under the judicial uh, ethics codes, um, and at some point in my life, I probably will not be under those codes. But until then, I'm restricted in, in much of what I, my independence can be. And I thank you for recognizing that. Um, Sentence judgment of this court that I concurrently um, on the two convictions, I'm going to sentence you to a one year conditional discharge, stay out of further trouble with the law, um, and I will impose the $250 fine, $125 surcharge, serve you with a summit with notice that if you willfully fail to uh, pay that, then um, it will be converted to a civil judgment. Um, you do have a right to. Uh, Appeal the sentence and judgment of this court. To do so, you must file a notice of appeal with this court within 30 days and duplicate, then perfect your appeal in the county court. Um, and if you need a form for that, it's available on New York State Court's website or available through the court clerk's office here. Thank you. And I'm sure we will see each other again. <laughs> <laughs>